you wear a hearing aid, turn the volume up to fast. Right? If you're thinking about sleeping, I'll be done in about 12 and a half minutes. This is the shortest sermon I think I ever preached. It's Father's Day. Isn't that my right, guys? Preach and sleep. And she said, I'm taking you out for dinner afterwards, and I'm hungry, so I'm headed out for dinner. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here today. It is a special day. It's a special day when we honor the fathers that have so faithfully served us. One of the greatest legacies that my father ever left to me was my faith, absolutely. Dad wasn't a minister. He hit me about the shoulder when I got full grown. It was about that wide just about that tall, just about that thick through. And you wouldn't have wanted to mess with my daddy if you saw him the way I saw him because he's one of the few men I ever saw who could take a 110 pound bale of hay in one hand and 110 pound in the other and throw the bale up into the loft of the barn one-handed. He wasn't a minister, but he was a church elder and he took his faith very seriously. He didn't make a big deal about it. He simply believed it. He didn't have to see God or have some icon of God. He didn't wear any fancy gold crosses around his neck. He simply believed. When Dad died, no, I'm not going to shed tears. I'm not trying to jerk tears for anybody here, okay? Smile at me. Death is part of life. When Daddy died, there was no huge insurance policy. I kept hoping I'd find one. I would have liked to have had a new Corvette at the time, but that wasn't to happen. He didn't have large blocks of stock or bonds. He didn't have a vacation home in some fancy far off place. I've got relatives who've got vacation homes you can't believe in places I couldn't even afford to go to because I couldn't afford the gasoline to get there. And not just little places either. Some of them are five bedroom and bigger. There were no land holdings to speak of. Daddy got half of a pretty good sized farm and he got Alzheimer's. Guess where the farm went? To pay for the Alzheimer's, because my daddy didn't believe in insurance. <laughs> so what? But when my father died, his legacy of faith was handed down to me as the legacy of a simple man who lived his entire life believing in God and believing in Jesus Christ, and he didn't need a miracle to prove it. He just knew it was true. And that's exactly what he'd tell me. All those harvest parties we'd have out on that farm, we'd go threshing wheat, get all done, there'd be 50, 100 guys around helping harvest that wheat. We'd get all done and Daddy would say, now listen, and he'd name a name. I don't want you believing what he's got to say, he's a liar. If the man spoke out against God, Daddy never raised a big deal. He didn't get up in anybody's face and threaten to beat him to a pulp unless he believed in God. And thank goodness for that, or I might be on a crusade to the Middle East right now. Now what Daddy did was he'd take me aside and he'd say, don't listen to that, that's not at all true. He didn't send me to church. He took me. He didn't make me sweat. Boy, I've done enough of that in my lifetime on that old bottomland farm. He showed me how to sweat. And I thought that was nice. He didn't raise his voice, but when my daddy talked, I listened. Because if I didn't, I knew that something bad would happen to me because he's an important man. Don't ask me how I knew that. He never said he was. So it came time for me to have my own family, and it seemed to me natural that I lead my family the same way my daddy had led me with a legacy of faith that didn't have to be proved every whip stitch. 
and didn't have to win the lottery to come true. Now I mention these things about my own father and read the scriptures today because it's daddy who came to mind on the scriptures I'm going to read. In these that I'm about to read, this is the story of a father, not a Christian man. He doesn't have faith, he has hope. And he hears about Jesus doing all this healing and his son is getting sick as a dog and he's about to die. And he goes to Jesus and said, you can help him. And Jesus said, what? You mean i got to perform miracles just to keep you guys believing? Go home. Your kids will. Do it. The man left. And suddenly he's about to have his own type of proof put to him. Go with me, please. I'm in John. I'm in chapter 4. I'm in verse 46. There's Bibles on the box of the pews ahead of you, or you'll find this, by the way, in your bulletin. This is by, in the New Living Translation. Take that white sheet that came in your bulletin, and it's right in the middle. Okay? But it's in the New Living Translation. It's a little different than the one I'm going to read here. Once more, this is Jesus here, once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official. Now this is a high class Roman. This guy wore good clothes. He made a good paycheck. Right? And there was a certain high class royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Now this is Jesus speaking, and you don't ever think of Jesus this way, but I think you ought to. I think this verse drips with sarcasm. I can just see Jesus standing there, rolling his eyes back in his head. Well, oh, gee whiz, not another one. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Who's your people? The Jews. They insisted on signs and wonders and miracles being formed. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. And but Jesus answered him, Go. Go, Jesus replied, Your son will live. And the man took Jesus at his word and departed when he was still on his way. His servants met him with the news that his son was living, and when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live, so he and his whole household believed, and that was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. How many signs do we need? I put to you that this father came to Jesus only with hope. He didn't have faith. He had hope. If you look at this passage, so many of you are making a big mistake. In fact, I've heard preachers make this with offhand comments during their sermon. Here's how it works. Somewhere in the middle of a discussion of this particular passage, one person will turn to another and say, you got to imagine the perils of Pauline. And Pauline tied to the railroad track. Remember that? Okay. I remember. Okay, I'm old enough to remember that. You don't have to. All right? Isn't this a beautiful expression of faith? <laughs> yes, it is, but not yet. That's where people make the mistake. Yes, it is, but not yet. The guy's still operating on hope. I put to you that the father represented here was not motivated by his faith at first. He just didn't want his kid to die. Heavens, all fathers feel this way if they're worth a single grain of salt. The father didn't know about Jesus directly. It doesn't say he followed him around watching the miracles. This father knew about Jesus by hearsay. And I hear that this Jesus guy did all these miracles, and he's hoping it'll do it for him. 
And right there, well, I'm sorry, that's one of the pitfalls of the prayers we make. Me too. <laughs> I had to include myself in this. We seem to think that because we're not always perfect in our faith, then Jesus won't listen to our prayer, or even if he does, if we ask him, we hope for the best, but we don't expect the best. We become desperate. So we say the prayer anyway, like this desperate father, oh God, you got to help me. Okay? Of course, you probably won't get that prayer answered either. I, mean, I didn't win the lottery last week, did you? See the difference? It's the difference between real faith that doesn't doubt at all and hope that has full of doubts in it and all <coughs> kinds of human arguments. Dad in this Bible verse was not a Christian. He wasn't some saint in the scriptures who could run around and write whole books for the Bible. He's an ordinary guy who thinks he's some sort of big shot, biggie wiggy kind of guy, making major decisions, a royal city official, a Roman citizen, and he's coming to Jesus out of desperation. He's not a Christian. I don't know how you feel about this, but I hope it's not with a certain sense of anger. Well, I want you to understand where I'm coming from here. I'm going to reread my version of what Jesus said to the man. This is half gospel according to Harry. It's not in the Bible, but here's what I think happened. What? He's talking to this guy. Do I have to do miracles continually so you will believe? And here's what I've added. Couldn't you just take my word for it, please? See what Jesus is asking us? Couldn't you just take my word for it? I'm the Son of God. This is how it is. Couldn't you just take my word for it? And we say, no, we can't. I'd really prefer the miracle. Could I win the lottery next week? <laughs> I've never won the lottery, have I? <laughs> Thank goodness. I can name you four department stores that would get an awful lot of it. <laughs> no, seriously. Here's where the real miracle comes in. I've, I've had them occur, and I'll bet you have too. You may not have given all the credit to God you should have. Remember now, to start out with, the Father only wanted a miracle. What I mean by that is that the Father would believe if Jesus would just make his son well, heal him right there on the spot, right? This is why Jesus said what he did about the miracles. What will you only believe if I perform miracles? But in spite of his own shortcomings, the Father's faith is about to grow up. And so does ours need to grow up too. Jesus simply says to him, go home, your son is cured. Now, I'm not a mind reader here. And I don't want to put words in God's mouth that God didn't want put there. But I'm going to lay you a small wager of chocolate chip cookies here. That this self-centered, arrogant city official thinks that Jesus knows his son better because he thinks Jesus practices magic, not God. And the truth, Dad doesn't really believe until when he meets the servants on the way home and they say, your son is up and run around and he's healed. And the man says, when? And he said, yesterday at 1 o'clock. And Jesus said, that's exactly when Jesus, and the man said, that's exactly when Jesus said he was well. That's the truth. I think the correct word here is bingo. <laughs> bingo. Suddenly the power of God and the power of the prayer is brought together and their quest is answered. So, 
<laughs> Up to this time, we have a father living in hope, and after that point, we have a, lo a father living in faith, just as he should be. Now, in Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 1, you'll find this in several different versions. But in one of the versions, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, of things not seen. And then the entire 11th chapter of Hebrews is about people who were good examples of faith in both the Old and the New Testament. There's Abel and Noah and Abraham and Joseph and so on. And they point out to us that hope and faith are considerably different. Do we have to fully understand this idea of faith? No, you don't. I don't. The results are the same whether I fully understand it or not. When we pray in true belief to God through Jesus Christ the Son, and we believe in those two, so what did this guy do? He and his whole family were saved. All of them. Now, fathers, I got a piece of advice for you in here, and I want you to listen to it carefully. <coughs> no matter what else you have to provide for your family, and you do have to provide, to provide a lot of things, if you've got teenagers, you better provide them with lots of cold food, right? All right? Yeah. If you've got an adult male preacher in your family, you need to provide him with steaks and baked potatoes. <laughs> Or chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> no matter what else you have to provide for your family, fathers, you haven't truly supported your family unless you've served as a guide to help them find the faith in God through Jesus Christ the Son, period. I can tell you this in my own lifetime. You will not fully understand this, and you won't always react in God's way to it. When my daddy died, there was one thing I wanted out of the whole estate. Daddy rode a bright yellow 90cc little motor scooter thing back and forth to the farm every day to feed. Okay? So I wanted that, and I ended up with it. And I took it home and I rode it. Had a little lever on the side, you could pull it up to power and climb hills, push it down right on the highway. I thought that was great. Until some of my children decided they wanted to wash that for me. So they did. Okay, now this is my one great inheritance, isn't it? It's worth maybe $50, who knows? Not much. But the centimeter value is high. You know, tie me to the railroad tracks. I love this thing. Dad, we washed it for you. See how clean it is? Hey, that's real enough. We washed it inside, too. Washed the inside? Yeah, we stuck the whole hose up the exhaust pipe and washed the inside of the engine. <laughs> now listen, to my everlasting credit, I did not jump up and down and scream and cry. <laughs> Not until later when I was locked in the bedroom with my wife where she could console me. <laughs> I don't understand everything you just know about being a father. Neither do any of you. But if your faith remains strong enough and true enough, then you can still guide your family in the way they should be guided. But God's love is an example, and loving them even when the silly things of life hit. The truth is this. Faith reaches its victory when Jesus answers our prayers, and he will. And faith reaches its victory when we believe simply because we believe, and we don't have to have proof anymore we believe, because God is his own proof in all things. God's his own proof. You don't have to go down to the coffee shop and defend God. You, you don't have to get on a street corner and have an argument with somebody of another faith and tell them to draw a whip. What you need to do is believe and repair your own self first with God so that you and God are one together through Jesus Christ the Son. Having no doubt 
his real faith, and that's the legacy of my father, and that's what I pass on to you today. And having only hope, well, that's weak faith, and it doesn't work very well. I know we live in a troubled world. We do. I'm so sick of wars, rumors of wars. I'm so sick of gang members who think all they have to do is go out and put some gang sign on the wall and they own that particular section of turf. I'm so sick of all the booze and the drugs and the hatred and the things I see in society. I'm just sick to death of this. But it's going to get worse before it gets better and it's time that we decide that we're not going to be a part of that scene. We're going to be a part of God's scene. And we're going to be good in this life because we have that ultimate faith. I'm all done preaching. If you want to join up with God, then you come down front to the end of the invitation song and let me take your confession of Christ. And then we'll go into baptistry and let me that you wash clean in the water and the blood, the spirit of Jesus Christ, so that you can die with him to the world and be raised anew just like he told Nicodemus. You must be born again. As we stand and sing, 325. <laughs> May the light of these scriptures light our lives, guide us in the way of righteousness, return us to worship again, and to teach other souls. We pray your blessing upon us. Dismiss us now. In Jesus' name, amen. May the good Lord bless and keep you.